learn about the muscle. You know, muscle, this name is derived from a Latin word musculus. This word muscle is coming from a Latin word musculus, which means little mouse. Okay, so here little mouse is the actual meaning of the word musculus. And the word muscle is derived from this Latin word musculus. The fleshy belly of a muscle is resembling the body of the mouse and the tendon is resembling its tail. So they call, you know, because of the fancy resemblance of the muscle with the mouse, they called it, you know, a muscle. This contractile tissue, what I mean to talk. Now what is the definition of a muscle? If we are trying to learn the definition of a muscle, the muscle is a contractile tissue of the body. The muscle is a contractile tissue of the body which brings in the desired movement of an organ or the body as a whole. The contractile tissue which brings in the desired movement of an organ or we can just say muscle is a contractile tissue which brings in the movement of an organ the movement of an organ and or the movement of the body as a whole so one organ you know the movement of one organ is produced by the muscles that is by the muscular contraction also the whole body is moving because of the contraction of the different muscles i hope i made it clear once again the definition of a muscle the contractile tissue present in the body which brings in the movement of an organ or the body as a whole which brings in the movement of an organ or the body as a whole is called muscle so we understand the special feature of the muscle is ability to contract. The ability to contract is the special feature of the muscle tissue. The muscle tissue is forming 40% of the body weight. So if you take a person is 100 kgs, 40 kgs of that person is because of its muscles. Okay? The red flesh or the red mass of the human is because of the muscles. The muscles, all of them are arising from the mesoderm except, you know, every rule has got exceptions. In the same way, almost all the muscles of the body are developing from mesoderm except the following muscles which are developing from ectoderm. So what are those muscles which are developing from the ectoderm? They are erector pylori muscle erector pylori muscle okay then you have got the muscles of iris and the myoepithelial cells the myoepithelial cells these are the three exceptions which are developing from the ectoderm otherwise the entire musculature of the body is developing from the mesoderm only these three are developing from the ectoderm now when we are trying to learn about the muscles we will just uh, discuss what are the three important types of muscles which are present in the body one that is the skeletal muscles okay two cardiac muscle three smooth muscle okay so these are the different types of muscles we are seeing in our body also we have got some special cells which are having the ability to contract the contractile property seen in some special cells these are the myofibroblasts okay and the myoepithelial cells these are also the part of the muscular tissue but they are not actually the muscular tissue but these are the individual cells which are having the ability they are the individual cells which are having the ability to contract okay now if you 
consider the skeletal muscle the name itself is telling skeletal means it is attached to the skeleton the muscles of your upper limb lower limb muscles of the abdomen you know today's order six pack <laughs> they are all attached you know they are all they are all forming the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall the six pack muscles okay the muscles contributing to the formation of six pack so we will be discussing about them in detail but just try to understand the muscles which are which are attached to the skeleton are called skeletal muscles these skeletal muscles they are supplied by nerves motor nerves okay sensory nerves these these skeletal muscles are under our voluntary control they work under our will and wish that's why you are calling them voluntary muscles when you see under a microscope the skeletal muscles they show striations because of that they are also called as striated muscles the dark band the white band isotropic band is the light band and isotropic band is the dark band we are going to learn in detail about them but just try to understand the skeletal muscles are also called as striated muscles because of the striations you are able to see they are also called voluntary muscles because they are very much under our will and wish and uh, under our control okay so uh, they are also called as somatic muscles okay so these are the different names of the skeletal muscles now coming to the cardiac muscle the name itself is suggesting cardiac means what in the region of the heart they are present very exclusive they are they very special the property of rhythmicity the rhythmic contraction is possible by these or in these cardiac muscles only and then they are present in the region of the heart we are going to learn about them in great detail and the special feature is intercalated discs or intercalary discs are present in the cardiac muscles now coming to the smooth muscles the walls of the intestines now you have got large intestine you got the small intestine so where the the small intestine especially you know when you are talking or the large intestine we say there is special movement called peristalsis the forward conduction of the food is by the peristaltic movement so that is the walls of the intestine the tunica media of the blood vessels they are all formed predominantly by the smooth muscle tissue that is present so the walls of the tubes are formed by that are present in the body or the hollow viscera the walls of the hollow viscera or the tubular structures like ureter like vas deferens they are all formed by the smooth muscles these smooth muscles they are not under our control so they are called involuntary muscles they are supplied by autonomic nerves and then they don't show striations which are that prominent or that very um prominently seen in case of the striated muscles so these get the name involuntary uh, unstriated or non striated muscles they are involuntary and also unstriated or non striated muscles the smooth muscles okay and these are supplied by the autonomic nerves then coming to the muscle as such what exactly do you understand where or what exactly will you tell looking at a muscle so the muscle has got a central fleshy part okay and this is called the belly what here i am drawing is the belly of the muscle okay it is the contractile unit it is fleshy it is bulgy it is belly like made up of so many myofibrils that are made up of actin and myosin filaments it is able to contract at least 15% to 30% it is able to contract okay so that is what we are trying to call the belly the muscle belly then it has got fibrous extensions these fibrous extensions are called the tendons so these are tendons now if you see the tendons these are rope like or cord like okay they are tough they are fibrous they are inelastic they are tough they are fibrous they are inelastic and non contractile the tendons don't contract only the fleshy belly here that is seen only the belly is able to contract because it is made up of the contractile proteins actin myosin you have other tropomyosin huh? those other filaments are there okay but just you try to understand that the belly is able to contract but the tendon which is inelastic and a non contractile that is not going to contract at all and coming to the uh, another type of 
uh, modification of this tendon I'm sorry now coming to that is one we said there's a fibrous cord like tendon other variation other variant which is present is the eponeurosis this eponeurosis is a very tough fibrous membrane right so here we are having a sheet like membrane you know it is a fibrous sheet that's what you call as eponeurosis for example if you take the muscles of the abdomen you have the external oblique muscle the internal oblique muscle the transversus abdominis muscle these muscles they are having an extensive area of attachment via the eponeurosis so if you take the muscles of the upper limb and lower limb here we have got tendons which are giving attachment the tendon of origin the tendon of insertion of course if you take the biceps brachii you have the tendon of insertion also you have got the bicipital eponeurosis the muscle which is present in the region of the brachium that is the anterior compartment biceps brachii the muscle with the two heads now again i use some words origin insertion now let us understand what you really mean by origin of a muscle or insertion of a muscle now please understand the end of the muscle the end e n d end of the muscle which doesn't move during contraction is called the origin of the muscle the end of the muscle which doesn't move or which remains fixed which remains fixed during the contraction is called origin and that end of the muscle which moves which is mobile especially during the contraction is called the insertion of the muscle that end of the muscle which is moving during the contraction is called the insertion of the muscle or the insertion part of the muscle please understand these words origin and insertion are not really fixed they are interchangeable depending upon the different types of the movements just for the sake of better understanding we are using this is the origin of the muscle this is the end of the muscle origin means the beginning of the muscle insertion means the termination of the muscle that's what we basically want to understand but because the muscle is a contractile unit because it is moving you know that is decreasing in size it is showing contraction so that end which is not moving or fixed we call origin and that which is moving is called insertion but they are not strictly adhered you can interchange with examples i'll be discussing it in the upcoming classes are you understanding and the muscle has got a nerve supply and a blood supply okay thank you let us quickly revise about the muscle the word muscle is coming from latin word musculus <coughs> musculus means a small mouse because of the resemblance because of the resemblance of the muscle tissue to a mouse that is the belly the contractile part of the muscle is looking like a mouse it is resembling the body of a mouse whereas the tendons are resembling like the tail the tendons are resembling the tail that's why you are using the word the muscle okay now if you see the definition of a muscle it is the contractile unit of a muscle i'm sorry if you see the definition the contractile unit which is producing movement of an organ or movement of the body as a whole is called the muscle so what is the definition the definition of the muscle is the contractile tissue or the contractile units of the body which are bringing out the movements of an organ or movement of the body as a whole are called as the muscles okay the muscle is basically forming 40% of the body weight in a human being and it is forming the red flesh of the human being the muscles are developed from the mesoderm at the same time every rule has got an exception there are some muscles which are developing from the ectoderm and they are the erector pilari muscle the muscles of the iris and the myoepithelial cells 
these three muscles are developing from or derived from the ectoderm. If you are trying to classify the muscle tissue of the body, the skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscles or the muscular tissues which are present in the body. There are individual specialized contractile cells which are called myofibroblasts and myoepithelial cells. So these cells are also having the ability to contract but they are not really forming tissues but they are individual cells that are having the ability to contract. Then the skeletal muscles they are also called as voluntary muscles because they are under our will and wish. They are also called striated muscles because they are showing the light and dark bands. Okay, And then these are present attached to the skeleton. Coming to the cardiac muscle, it is present in the heart. It is having a special feature called a rhythmic contraction and intercalated discs or intercalary discs that are present only in the cardiac muscle. And coming to the smooth muscles, they are present in the walls of the intestines, they are present in the tunica media and tunica adventitia of the blood vessels. These smooth muscles, they are not under our control, so they are called involuntary muscles, they don't show any uh, prominent striations, they are called non-striated or unstriated muscles. Okay, we will learn more about them in the future classes in great detail. Now coming to the muscle, so the central fleshy contractile part. The central fleshy contractile part is called the belly of the muscle. It is made up of the myofibrils, actin, myosin, tropomyosin. There are so many different proteins which are forming. Predominantly actin and myosin are the contractile film proteins of the body. Then if you see there are the tendons which are nothing but the rope-like, cord-like, fibrous extensions of the muscle which are rope-like, cord-like, fibrous extension. They are made up of dense connective tissue. They are very firm, they are inelastic, they are non-contractile. Okay, in great detail we will be learning about the tendons in the upcoming classes. And then we have got another modification of the tendon that is the modification of the tendon where it is uh, in the form of a sheet like a fibrous we said tendon is rope like cord like other type is sheet like extensive area of attachment when it is necessary for a muscle then there is fibrous sheet like structure that is present which is called aponeurosis okay so the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall if you take the internal oblique the deeper to that internal oblique is the transversus abdominis above the internal oblique is the external oblique so these muscles they have got the aponeurotesis attached to them and you can really appreciate during the dissection hours because when you are dissecting the upper limb and lower limb muscles you can appreciate the tendons the tendon of origin tendon of insertion in the region of upper limb we say the biceps brachii muscle which is present in the front of the brachium or the anterior compartment of the brachium it has got a tendon of insertion at that region only, uh, where there is tendon of insertion, you get a small extension and that is called the bicipital aponeurosis, which is uh, seen in the cubital fossa, the roof of the cubital fossa, you have got this bicipital aponeurosis. So you have this bicipital aponeurosis in the region of cubital fossa. You have the region of, you have the bicipital aponeurosis in the region of cubital fossa. Okay, and coming to the origin of the muscle, the insertion of the muscle, the two ends of a muscle. The end of a muscle which is relatively fixed or doesn't move is called the origin. The end of a muscle which is moving or flexible or it is showing some movement, so that is called the insertion of the muscle. The end of the muscle which is mobile, which is moving or movable that becomes the insertion the end of the muscle which is fixed remains the origin but the word insertion and origin are not really fixed strictly we can't adhere sometimes these are interchangeable also okay so we'll be learning in the future classes uh, the, with examples thank you very much now naming of the muscles that is the nomenclature how are the muscles which are present in the body named okay 
so it is the naming of the muscles which you also call as the nomenclature of the muscles now according to the location according to the location they are labeled now what are the examples of the muscles according to the location if you see this portion is called the temporal region so in the region of temporal region here what muscle we have got temporalis so we have got the muscle temporalis okay in the same way we have got tibialis anterior a muscle which is called tibialis anterior so what do you understand it is present in the anterior portion of the tibia or anterior to tibia there is a muscle present and that's what you are calling it as tibialis anterior okay so that is called tibialis anterior are you able to appreciate okay so these names are suggesting where that is present for example if you take scapula some more examples we'll discuss above the spine of scapula supraspinatus below the spine of the scapula on the dorsal surface infraspinatus then along the costal surface of the scapula you have subscapular fossa the muscle present in the subscapular fossa is called subscapularis are you understanding so depending upon the region or the location of the muscle it is getting its name okay temporalis muscle in the temporal fossa supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles in the supraspinatus and infraspinous fossa and then we have got the subscapularis muscle in the subscapularis fossa and tibialis anterior that is present in anterior to the tibia the bone of the lower limb okay then according to the shape again their name according to the shape some muscles may be the right and left half when you take they are forming a trapezium a trapezoid they are forming and accordingly they are called as trapezius because of the trapezoid shape what they are forming in the same way you have got rhomboidus the muscles which are rhomboid in shape they are called rhomboidus the rhomboidus major the rhomboidus minor okay now according to the attachments so from where to where they are extending so according to the attachments again they are classified i mean according to the attachments again they are named now what are they sternocleidomastoid what is the name of the muscle sternocleidomastoid the sternocleidomastoid muscle is starting from the sternum and the clavicle the sternum and the clavicle getting inserted into the mastoid process sternocleidomastoid as the name suggests in the same way you have got the muscle styloglossus from the styloid process to the tongue that is it is extending one end is attached to the styloid process other end is attached to the tongue genioglossus one end is attached to the genial tubercles of the mandible and other end is at the tongue so in the same way you have got cricothyroid starts from the cricoid cartilage ends at the level of thyroid cartilage so you got cricothyroid then you got styloglossus and you got genioglossus the sternocleidomastoid the muscle in seen in the region of the neck are you able to understand then according to the number of heads again they are named what do you mean by number of heads if two heads are present it is called biceps brachii if three heads are present it is called triceps and if it is having four heads not forceps quadriceps it is called quadriceps if it is having four heads okay so here the depend, depending upon the number of the heads it is given these names okay short head long head the both heads so that is biceps like that you have got long head medial head lateral head triceps are you understanding then according to the 
number of ends, then attachments, then shape, then location, direction of the fibers. According to the direction of fibers. You know, there is a muscle, rectus abdominis. Rectus means straight. The word rectus, if you talk, rectus means straight. So the muscle which is present straightly in front of the abdomen or in the anterior abdominal wall. The muscle which is running straightly in front of the abdomen or in the anterior abdominal wall that is called rectus abdominis. Okay. In the same way, if there is a muscle that is present straight to the femur, in front of the femur it is going straight. What is that called? Rectus femoris. Good. So that muscle is called rectus femoris because it is running straight in front of the femur. In the same way we have got transversus abdominis. So the muscle which is present in the abdomen and that is running transversely. The fibers are running transversely. It is called transversus abdominis. Then you have the muscles which are named according to the sizes. So here if you talk the sizes. This is very important, please understand. In one region, there can be a muscle present. For example, we said above the spine of the scapula, supraspinatus, below the spine, infraspinatus. In the same way, the temporal region, temporalis, we have discussed. Now, if you ask me, in front of the chest, you have got pectoralis, that is called the pectoral region. You got, you call this region, that is the anterior chest wall as the pectoral region. Now there are two muscles present. What will you call them? Depending upon the size, you call them pectoralis major and pectoralis minor. So major means large in size, minor means small in size. So in the region of the anterior chest wall, pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. In the same way, if you take the adductor compartment of the thigh, the medial compartment of the thigh, you have so many muscles. Then what do you call the smallest muscle? Adductor brevis. The, uh, the muscle which is longer or bigger than this brevis is adductor longus. The muscle which is very very large is adductor magnus. So depending upon the size, yes, size does matter for the naming. In the same region, when you have many muscles, in the same way you take the gluteal region. In the gluteal region, you have got gluteal muscles. What are they? Gluteus maximus, very large. In fact, the largest muscle of the body. Then you have got the gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus. So the region is gluteal region, but there are muscles of different sizes. So you are calling them maximus, medius, minimus. And let me revise quickly for you. The largest muscle is gluteus maximus. Longest muscle is sartorius. Longest means length wise, largest means area wise. Okay, and this, so that is enough, I think. Okay, then coming to the class the nomenclature of the muscle according to the action or according to the function, again they are classified into you know the adductors, the muscles which are causing adduction of the thigh. They are called adductors of the thigh. In the same way, if you take, this is the wrist, this is the ulnar side and this is the radial side. Here, the medial portion is the ulnar side. Here, it is the radial side. Okay. Now, what is that action I am performing? This is extension. So, here, this is the muscles which are causing extension. Extensor carpi radialis. Okay. Here, it is extensor carpi ulnaris. In the same way, if I am flexing, if I am flexing, what is this? Flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. So that particular region, they are helping in the action. Okay. So depending upon the action, what they are doing, you call them. If they are responsible for extension, you call them extensors. If they are doing flexion, flexors. If they are causing medial rotation or lateral rotation, accordingly you will call the muscles are medial rotators or the muscles are lateral rotators. So depending upon the function, also you are naming them. Is that fine? Okay. 
I hope at least I gave you some idea how exactly the nomenclature of the muscles in anatomy is done to the best of my ability. Thank you. Now let us quickly revise about the naming of the muscles. You know, the nomenclature of the muscles you can call it. There are some criteria that are followed when you are trying to name the muscle in anatomy. What are the criteria and what are the names which we have given following those criteria. Let us revise. If you see some muscles, they are named according to the location where exactly they are present. For example, you see in the temporal region you have got a muscle that is present and that is called temporalis. There is a muscle that is present anterior to the tibia or on the anterior border of the tibia and then you call it as tibialis anterior. And then we also have, if you take the spine of the scapula, above the spine of the scapula on the dorsal surface, you have supraspinatus, tus which is present in the supraspinous fossa. You have got the muscle infraspinatus, which is present in the infraspinous fossa of the scapula. Similarly, in the region of the subscapular fossa, you are having the subscapularis muscle. These are few, for example, for me to discuss. Then, according to the shape, so the muscles are also named according to the shape, what they have. So, trapezoid or a trapezium, when the muscles are resembling a trapezium, then they are labeled as trapezi trapezius. In the same way, when they are resembling a rhomboid, they are called as rhomboidus. Okay, now coming to the attachments, so where do the muscles begin and where do they end? For example, some muscles, they are starting from the sternum and the clavicle, the sternocleidomastoid muscle we are talking now. Sternocleidomastoid, so if you see the first part, sternocleido, that is the muscle is arising from the sternum and the clavicle and mastoid is the insertion part. So sternocleidomastoid. In the same way, you have got muscles called styloglossus, genioglossus. Styloglossus, the muscle start is having one attachment at the styloid process ending at the region of tongue or uh, it is extending up to the tongue. The muscle, I repeat, now we'll, I repeat, the muscle styloglossus is having one end attached to the styloid process, other end in the region of tongue. In the same way, we have got genioglossus, which is having one end at the genial tubercles of the mandible and again the other end is at the tongue. So, you have got styloglossus, genioglossus. In the same way, we have got cricothyroid. So, the muscle is starting at the, or one end is attached to the cricoid cartilage, the other end is at the thyroid cartilage. Okay? Again, the muscles are named depending on the number of heads. They are biceps, triceps and quadriceps. So biceps, muscle with two heads, triceps, muscles with three heads. The muscles with four heads are called quadriceps, not forceps. Okay? Then, coming to the naming of the muscles according to the direction of the fibers, we got this rectus abdominis muscle or rectus femoris muscle, the transversus abdominis muscle. If you take the word rectus, what exactly does it mean? It means straight. So rectus abdominis muscle, a muscle which is running straight in the region of abdomen, in the anterior abdominal wall is called rectus abdominis. In the same way, a muscle which is running straight over the femur is called rectus femoris. And when you talk about transversus abdominis, the muscle fibers are running transversely in the region of abdomen, in the anterior abdominal wall or constituting the formation of the anterior abdominal wall. That's why you are aptly calling it as transversus abdominis. Then coming to the naming of the muscles depending upon the sizes. Now if you take a particular region, for example this front of the chest, this is called the pectoral region. In this region, maybe you are having two muscles. Now, when we are trying to label them, we go with the sizes. So here in the region of the pectoral region, in the pectoral region, we have two muscles. Pectoralis major, pectoralis minor. The bigger one is major, smaller one is minor. In the same way, if you take the gluteal region, it has got gluteus maximus, the largest muscle of the body. Smaller to that, you have got gluteus medius. Still smaller to that, you have got gluteus minimus. In the same way, if you take the adductor compartment of the thigh, we have got adductor brevis. Brevis means short. 
and then adductor longus that means long and adductor magnus that means very large are you able to understand then coming to the naming according to the action or the function of the muscles when the muscles are doing adduction they are all called adductors when they are all doing flexion then they are called flexors now this portion the muscles which are present in the forearm the anterior compartment they are all called flexors of forearm that which are present in the posterior compartment are called extensors of forearm are you understanding so depending upon the action what they are doing they are given names and that's what you call them as extensors or adductors or medial rotators or lateral rotators whatever it is okay i hope you have understood something enough substantial thank you see small bones a very frequently asked question and even it is very interesting for the doctors also for the anatomists also and here you know two mark question or a short note or a very short note frequently that is asked even students like to answer it so we will discuss about that c smoid bones it is an arabic word which is starting from the c sum you know c sum means seed like you know kale til kale til ka beej you say nalanuvul antam telugulo nalanuvul so this is coming from that c sum okay the c smoid bones because of the resemblance with the c sum seeds you are calling it as a c smoid bone now here please understand when you have a bone okay now that is the bone to this bone you have got the tendon that is attached and here you have got the contractile fleshy belly of the muscle okay so between the tendon and the bone you have got the c smoid bones that are developing between the tendon at the site of the attachment of the tendon with the bone you get a small bony nodule a seed like small bony nodule and that's what you are calling it as the c smoid bone so here in our body the largest c smoid bone which is triangular in shape it is nothing but patella which is developing in the tendon of quadriceps femoris you are understanding so here we know we have got a muscle called quadriceps femoris in the tendon of quadriceps femoris we are having patella which is also called as knee cap okay this is called as a knee cap and we also have got in the region of lower limb many seismoid bones for example there is fabella so this fabella is from the lateral head of gastrocnemius if you see the lateral head of gastrocnemius muscle this muscle is also having a seismoid bone and that is called fabella and the peroneus longus you have so many seismoid bones not just in the lower limb even in the upper limb you have got for example if you take flexor carpi ulnaris you have got pisiform one of the carpal bones pisiform or pisiformis whatever you say pisiform which is developing in flexor carpi ulnaris in the tendon of this muscle flexor carpi ulnaris we are having pisiform okay so these are the seismoid bones for example i have given them now what is the action of the seismoid bone it reduces the friction it alters the pull of the muscle it alters the pull the direction of the pull of the muscle this seismoid bone will alter it acts as a pulley during the contraction of a muscle it is acting like a pulley during the contraction of a muscle it is maintaining the local blood supply it is maintaining the local blood supply if you see this seismoid bones they don't have periosteum they don't have periosteum they don't have haversian canals so these two the seismoid bones don't have what they don't have they don't have periosteum and they don't have haversian canals okay and some anatomists and some researchers what they say because it is not having periosteum we can't call it a bone so we say seismoid bone they say no no it is not a bone why whenever we said bone it is have periosteum but seismoid bone does not have periosteum so some are telling no no we should not call it a bone because it is not having periosteum okay 
and for you to understand this is moid bowl okay the sesame seed like it is covered by articular cartilage especially the patella it is covered by the articular cartilage that's common you know whenever the bone is involved in the formation of the joint it will have one covering of it is that fine thank you let us quickly revise the sesamoid bone sesamoid bone the term sesamoid is an arabic word it means sesame seed like what are sesame seeds you call them nallanuvulu kalethil in hindi you call so here the sesame seed the resemblance of the bone with the sesame seed is making us call it as a sesamoid bone it is developing within the uh, tendons of or uh, it is developing at the region of the tendon so the region of the attachment of the tendon with the bone it is developing at the site of attachment of tendon with the bone here we get the sesamoid bones okay the sesamoid bones example we have got patella which is developing in the tendon of quadriceps femoris we have got fabella which is developing in the tendon of lateral head of gastrocnemius muscle then we have got pisiform which is developing in the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris also we have got many sesamoid bones which don't have names for example some sesamoid bones they are developing in the tendon of peroneus longus like that you have many okay and if you are trying to talk about the function of the sesamoid bone the function is it alters the direction of the pull it acts like a pulley during the contraction of a muscle it reduces friction it maintains blood circulation okay now coming to the features of the sesamoid bone what is the characteristic feature it lacks periosteum it lacks haversian canal so there is no periosteum there is no haversian canal in case of a sesamoid bone so some people the anatomists and the research scholars they say no maybe we should not call it as a bone because it is not having periosteum thank you we are going to discuss about the color of the skin okay so you know you are seeing people some are black some are brown some are fair okay now what are those pigments which are imparting the color to the skin so first we have got melanin melanin is a black brown pigment okay it is giving a black color or brown color to the skin if it is present in large quantity yes the person will be a black little less quantity brown very less maybe they are fair you are understanding so here this melanin is produced by cells called melanocytes and melanocytes are present in the stratum germinativum or the germinal layer of the epidermis of skin you know the epidermis has got five layers skin has got two layers dermis epidermis this epidermis has five layers the basal layer is the stratum germinativum or the germinal germinal layer of the epidermis where you have got melanocytes present okay these melanocytes which are present they produce melanin and this is imparting the black or brown color to our skin then second pigment is the carotene the carotene is orangish in color okay it is orangish in color this pigment is present in the stratum corneum it is present in the stratum corneum also in the superficial fascia and also it is present in the fat cells of dermis the fat cells of dermis they are all having this carotene so you can call it orangish or you can even call it yellow you know yellow to orange is the shade of the carotene okay and we have got hemoglobin okay hemoglobin is also imparting color to the skin especially when it is oxy oxygenated hemoglobin or oxy hemoglobin you see on the cheek especially when the girls are shining or blushing it's all pinkish in color this is just because of the oxygenated blood so the oxygenated blood is reddish in color and this oxy hemoglobin is giving that pinkish color okay and sometimes 
you have to understand why did I why did I start with the color of the skin? Because there is a condition called albinism. What is albinism? See, if you have seen the peacocks, some peacocks. When you talk peacock, it is very very colorful. Okay, we say in clothes also peacock green, peacock blue. But sometimes you see some peacocks are totally white. What are they called? Albinos. What is albino? That is the white peacock or in people, in humans, where there is no melanin pigment, they are called albinos. Please understand, melanin pigment is not present. Melanocytes are present. Okay. Actually, there is an amino acid tyrosine. This tyrosine is converted into melanin in the presence of an enzyme called tyrosinase. The absence of this enzyme tyrosinase, the absence of this enzyme tyrosinase is responsible for lack of production of melanin and the whole body is totally white. If you see the albino patients, they are white, their hairs are also white. You are understanding, their eyelashes, their eyelids, they are all white, just observe next time. So, melanocytes are present in them, cells are present, but the ability of production of melanin is not there because of absence of this enzyme tyrosinase. And there is another condition and that is called vitiligo. It is called vitiligo. Now, what is this vitiligo? If you see some people, they are having a nice color, but at certain regions, total whitish patches appear at the nape of the neck or certain regions of the body, especially at the nape of the neck, you see totally white white patches and that is called vitiligo. Now why are they having patches? Because they don't have melanocytes at that particular region due to lack of melanocytes at that particular region you are having the vitiligo. Are you understanding? But albino is a condition where melanocytes are present but melanin pigment is not produced. Why the pigment is not produced? What is the problem? Absence of enzyme tyrosinase. So the tyrosine cannot be converted into melanin. Are you understanding? Albinism and vitiligo. These are the two clinical conditions you can expect in exam as a short note. Thank you.